Kim, wonderful author, best-selling author, founder and chairman of the Neobank uh, movement. So we are pleased to have you here. I hope you're enjoying. How is everything? Can you tell me what you are? Yeah, it's, it's, look, it's great to be back in the UAE. I lived here for five years. Um, and I really sort of, you know, it, it's great to see uh, this, the Abu Dhabi and Dubai thriving and, um, you know, and, and, and the conference, it looks like a great event. The stage is spectacular. Yeah. So as a speaker, you always love being on a, a nice stage like that. Also being in the winter in the UAE is a great ride. <laughs> of course, it's a bit warmer than New York at the moment. Oh, yeah. Some few specific questions sure. for our viewers. So I would like to know: when talking about the future of banks, you always uh, mention what like surviving banks. Uh, why do you say so? I say busy. that very purposely um, okay. because not all banks will survive. In fact, I think that by 2030, if you look at continental Europe and you look at the United States, we'll probably see a reduction by 25, 30 percent of the number of banks. In, in the world because they'll be consolidated um, and new entrants will be taking market share. Okay, you think it's a, it's a DeFi threatening to these banks to survive? Well, DeFi is sort of the next generation of this technology, um, particularly as we start automating society with robotics and algorithms, smart contracts and things like that. So DeFi is still very, very early. It's going to be another decade, really, before we see the real changes that DeFi will bring. I see. So uh, how can blockchain reduce cost of management in public and private organizations, according to your opinion? Uh, well, blockchain can't on its own. Really? <laughs> but it can when it's used for specific elements of a digital society. So for example, um, we can improve uh, efficiency um, and process around identity um, by putting identity on the blockchain. Uh, reduce identity theft. It would uh, um, it, you know, improve cross-border communication when it comes to, or transactions when it comes to identity. Like today, for example, if I move from the US to uh, the UK, I have to completely start again. A new bank account, new driver's yes. license, all of that. So, you know, in the 21st century, we, we need things like blockchain identity so you don't have to, you know, have that disconnect. Yeah, well, okay. So, what you have, what do you think about the metaverse transitioning to this, to metaverse, to virtual reality? <laughs> yeah. It, it's, what is your thought? It, 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 it's something that I've been reading about yeah. as a science fiction fan wow. for many years, okay. you know. There's a movie uh, series coming out on Apple TV next year called Snow Crash, okay. based on a book written by Neil Stevenson in the 1980s, right. um, which was one of the first real mm -hmm. books on the metaverse. Um, and then you've got Ready Player One. I, I don't know if you saw that movie, yeah, right. um, which you know sort of has the metaverse in it as well. Um, so um, I've been dreaming about the metaverse for years. So um, the technology is finally getting to that point where we can execute virtual worlds um, in a in a way that is uh, you know technologically achievable. Um, but this is where it gets interesting because people will be able to have jobs in the metaverse. You know, we just saw Nike buy a, a yeah. virtual shoe company. So you'll be able to create designs. You'll be able to sell assets in the digital world to support yourself in the in the real world IRL. Um, and so it's a very, you know, it's it's going to be uh, part of the thing that sort of saves us from automation in respect to the disruption of employment is the metaverse will create a lot of new employment opportunities. Yeah, what challenges, like the social challenges, can governments face uh, in our close future? Well, the, the biggest change for the 21st century is really going to be automation of government. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you hear people in the US, for example, talking about socialism as being very evil, it's because they're saying someone has to pay for these services that we give to, to citizens. But, um, you know, for example, we demonstrate in the book where we could reduce the cost of health care in the United States by 70% using automation. And so that's when it's cheaper than the existing system and you can still give health care to everybody. Why would you argue against it? You'd only argue against it if you're a psychopath and you don't want people to be healthy, right? So, um, you know, this is basically, techno-socialism is 
economically very right wing but socialistically very left wing using technology to provide sort of basic services to to everyone eliminating homelessness um, you know providing health care education um, you know and, and access to food for everybody so basically emerging technology will save our lives it has it... the potential to yeah. the technology um, can be used for this but it really depends on our philosophy as to how we think about accessibility and uh, and, and equality and um, you know those sorts of core social issues. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your time. I hope no problem. Check out the new book, yes. Rise of Techno Socialism.